In this video, we'll talk about some principles from my upcoming book, Resilience in the Face of Multiple Sclerosis. The publication date is October 1st, 2019, and from October 1st through October 5th, it will be completely free on Amazon. Let's have some fun. I want to start with a story. These are the words of Sandra, who was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis January 19, 90, 1993. My head was spinning. I was in severe pain. On a scale of 1 to 10, it was a 20. I couldn't even turn my head to the left because I was in such pain. I had paralysis of my right face. My throat had closed down and I could not eat. I had peripheral blindness of both eyes. I felt like I was dying. I lost faith. I lost hope. I lost my career as a healthcare professional. I was slowly going to a state of depression and I felt worthless to society. I went to my nephew Jonathan when he was seven days old and I said to him, I'm not going to be around. I'm going to be a little angel watching over you. What's amazing about this quote is that if you met Sandra today, you would see a totally different person. And it's not because her multiple sclerosis was cured. This is Sandra here, and she actually went on to develop secondary progressive MS, and she has a lot of physical problems, as you can see. However, she's an incredibly happy, fulfilled, and productive person. She could never go back to work as a healthcare administrator, but she changed gears in life. She got into politics and became a well-known local political activist. She was famous for various demonstrations, including demonstrating against the City of Bell scandal, in the Tri-City area in 2010. And she's just such a happy, enthusiastic person who knows everyone and has tons of friends and wakes up every day with something to do. But she wasn't always that way. She was very depressed, even institutionalized at one point. And I want that to be a reminder to anyone who's facing the first few years of a multiple sclerosis diagnosis, that even though it may seem overwhelming, you're going to change and evolve as a person because resilience is a process not a trait. I could define resilience as the ability to achieve a good outcome in the face of adversity. As you can see in the stress diathesis model of resilience, everyone faces adversity and everyone experiences some suffering, but resilient people manage to come out relatively ahead. And some people actually gain things from traumatic experiences. There's a lot of research in post-traumatic stress disorder and other catastrophic events, and they find that People who experience adversity often find awareness of new opportunities and new possibilities. For instance, if Sandra never developed MS, possibly she would still be a healthcare administrator and never would have developed an interest in politics. Often people develop stronger personal relationships and stronger connections to others who suffer the same type of problems. When you have MS, you feel very close to others with the same disease. People are often more aware of their strengths, even if they have weaknesses, though they're also more aware of their vulnerabilities to traumatic events beyond their control. Some people value life more than they did before, often growing appreciative of things they may have taken for granted in the past. And some people experience a major change in philosophy, a deeper spiritual life. And sometimes they go down a path they never would have imagined they would ever go down. Based on the book, The Resilience Factor, they identify, Ravich and Shat, seven factors of resilience. The most important things are to control your emotions and impulses so that you have the mindset ready to face the adversity. You have to be optimistic and you have to have an analytical mind, which they call causal analysis, the ability to think through an adversity and know what you have to do next. You have to have empathy for other people so you can develop connections and really understand people. You have to have self-efficacy, the confidence in your own strength, in your own ability to evolve and change. And you have to reach out because no man or woman is an island. We all have to depend on other people, on our community, our family, and our friends. And if you think about multiple sclerosis outcomes, it's really not about EDSS or time 25 foot walk or MRI lesions. Really, it's about life satisfaction, productivity, having a sense of purpose. And there's so many factors that play into it. Certainly disease factors are important, but there's also your social support and your psychological resilience. And these things are very important. One 
a psychologist who really inspired me is Martin Seligman. He criticized the field of psychology for being too negative, too focused on schizophrenia, on anxiety, on depression, people with diseases. What about the ability to help ordinary people live better lives and be happier? So he researched what it is that makes people happy, and he identified three things. One is pleasure, which is sort of a simple hedonistic happiness, watching an enjoyable movie, eating ice cream. But he argues that these things are very fleeting and also very habituating. If you eat $40 steaks every day, they don't taste as good anymore. And there also seems to be a genetic component to hedonistic pleasure that cannot be changed. More important, he believes, are engagement and meaning. Engagement is an activity that engrosses you and distracts you and takes up your time. A chess player completely focused on the board and the strategy, someone who enjoys their profession or the art that they pursue, that just completely engrosses them and distracts them. And the last thing is meaning, having a greater purpose in life, wanting to be someone, wanting to achieve someone, wanting to make connections with people. And he really believes that it is engagement and meaning that is more important than simple pleasure in the long run. And he extends this concept to the acronym of PERMA, positive emotion, engagement, meaning, and then he adds relationships and achievement. Our relationships with other people can be powerful and give us a much happier life. And pursuing things that are meaningful to us in terms of achievements, they don't have to be grand, they don't have to achieve widespread recognition, but they have to be important to us and they give us goals to go after. And in terms of the concept of meaning, if, no, if you haven't read this book, Viktor Frankl is the author of a famous book, Man's Search for Meaning, where he describes his experience as a captive during the Holocaust. And he's experiencing these harrowing problems. He's seeing his family members die. He's being tortured and starved. But it occurs to him, has all this suffering, this dying around us, a meaning? For if not, then ultimately there is no meaning to survival. In other words, if there's no meaning to your life, then you're dead already. So think about what is the meaning or purpose in your life and what changes do you have to make to pursue that? From an evidence-based perspective, there are things you can do to improve your happiness. Eat abundant whole fruits and vegetables, develop strong social relationships, find a job or career or hobby that you enjoy, form a romantic relationship with someone, especially to another happy person and try to spend time with other happy people and try to exercise regularly. I talk about various schools of psychology in my book, but one that stuck out at me is acceptance and commitment therapy. And one aspect of this form of therapy is they encourage you to try to clarify your values in life. And if you look at this chart, there are various principles of values in life. Are you someone that cares about your career and success? Do you care about romance? Do you care about charity? Do you care about going out in nature? Do you care about fitness and health? Try to think of the things that are most important to you. And some people, they may have values that they believe, but they're not acting in congruence with that. So think to yourself, am I actually acting in congruence with my true values in life or do I need to make a major change? Um, in the National MS Society, there is a, a resilience seminar put on by Don Eady and Kevin Alshuler, and they give very specific advice. Among them, they recommend that you keep a gratitude journal. Every day, write things that you're appreciative of. They could be simple things, but even recognizing them will make you happier and calmer. If you have stress in your life, as we all do, consider a regular meditation practice. It can make a huge difference. Even if you aren't able to work in the traditional sense, try to do something that benefits other people. Try to find something to do that is altruistic. It will benefit not just the beneficiary, but also the person out carrying out the charity. And last and not least, the 20 second rule. When you get an idea, try to immediately take action on it, even if it's as simple as dedicating time in your calendar to address it in more detail later. And I leave you with some advice from the American Psychological Association. Form good, strong, powerful, long relationships with family members, friends, and people in your community. 
When you're facing a problem that seems huge, try to break it down into smaller, solvable, or at least adaptable problems. And understand that change is part of life. None of us have a permanent life, and none of us are guaranteed health forever. Make goals and take action towards achieving those goals. And constantly work on improving yourself. Be optimistic and maintain a healthy and balanced perspective, being hopeful about the future. And take care of yourself. Make sure that you sleep well, you eat a good diet, you exercise regularly, and you learn to manage your stress. 